me just go into the intro lecture for the class. So this is more about kind of the history of vitamins, and then we're just going to review the DRIs as well. Uh, I know you learned about those before, but um, we're going to be talking about them a lot, so I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. So the discovery of the vitamins, um, it's important to remember that nutrition is a really young science. Basically, most of the stuff was discovered roughly in the past 100 years, so we didn't really understand much about it until really like the early 1900s. And that's when, I guess, nutrition really started kind of moving along or it started getting interest when people started discovering the vitamins. So before that, people knew that carbohydrates, protein and fat, and some minerals were essential, but they didn't really understand or they, they had no concept that there was this whole other group of organic compounds called the vitamins that existed and that our body needed them to basically function properly. So at first, the vitamins were actually called accessory growth factors. Um, and just to kind of show you, the very first one that was actually discovered was thiamine. Um, it was called at, the, at that point an anti-berry berry substance. And it was isolated from rice polishings. So back in the early 1900s in parts of Asia, uh, people started polishing their rice, and that means that they're basically removing this outer husk to have just the rice kernel, which is like typically what we refer to as rice. Um, and then what they started noticing in the populations that were removing this outer husk of the kernel, that those populations started developing neurological disorders, they started developing some skin rashes, and then they realized that Basically, that husk of the rice contained um, a special growth factor, I guess as they would call it, um, that helped people basically be healthy. And so what they did was they then took the rice husk and then isolated that vitamin from it and found that when they added that vitamin back or the rice husk back into their diets, that all these problems would go away. So all of their neurological and dermatological problems would go away. So a lot of things, and we're going to go over this kind of over and over again in the class, but most of the vitamins were discovered through deficiency disorders that they noticed when people were kind of um, messing with their diets, I guess you could say, like removing parts of, you know, rice or whatever, just avoiding certain foods, that that's when these deficiency disorders would happen. And then they eventually kind of figured out what food it was and then isolated the vitamin from that food. But yeah, it all really started with um, deficiency disorders. So that first vitamin that was discovered again was thiamine. That's vitamin B1. And the scientist, Kazimir Funk, is a Polish biochemist. He gave it the name vitamin. And he called it that because vit is basically the word for life in Latin. And he thought it was essential for life, which it is. And then it also had an, uh, an amine group in it. So that's, uh, yeah, how the word vitamin, vitamin came along. But at first it was a vitamin. And then very shortly after, another group of scientists, McCollum and Davis, discovered the second vitamin, which was vitamin A. And they called it fat-soluble vitamin A because they noticed that the first vitamin, thiamine, was water-soluble. So yeah, the very first two that were discovered was vitamin A and then vitamin B. But vitamin B was the first and then vitamin A. And then each, it, there was kind of admittedly like a race after that where they were like, oh, wow, you know, because people, if you were to discover one of these things, you'd get a Nobel Prize, basically. So people just started going crazy and they're like, we need to discover how many are there? What's going on with all this? So they basically, yeah, in the early 1900s is pretty much when all the vitamins were discovered. And then as they discovered them, they just basically named them like A, B, C, D, etc., um, and then eventually the E from vitamin was dropped because they realized that very few of the vitamins actually contain that amine group. So what's an, what is a vitamin? What's the definition? Basically, it's an organic compound that has a regulatory function in the body. And it's basically required because we can't make it. 
So sometimes you'll see um, as we get into the lecture material that we can actually make components of the vitamin, but sometimes we can't like join the components together. Or sometimes we can make almost the whole vitamin, but then we can't do the last little bit. So basically a vitamin is something that helps our body function properly, but we can't make it. So we need to consume it from our diet. General characteristics of vitamins. In general, you'll see they're not related chemically. They look very different from each other. And I'll show you the structure of each of them as we go um, through every vitamin. But they do have pretty different physiological roles. Um, the only exception is really the B vitamins. The B vitamins, there's a bunch of different B vitamins, and they're all called vitamin Bs because they kind of all have somewhat of a similar function. They basically help the Krebs cycle to move along. So they have all these different kind of secret roles in glycolysis in the Krebs cycle. They've been there the whole time, but I'll point out exactly which ones are the B vitamins. But they're all things that you're pretty familiar with. So it's, yeah, I kind of call them the secret vitamins. But those are the ones that have somewhat similar roles. There are two major broad classifications for the vitamins, so water-soluble vitamins and fat-soluble. And that's because the body handles water-soluble vitamins in a certain way in terms of absorption, digestion, excretion. Um, and it, that's different from the way that the body would handle fat-soluble vitamins. So fat-soluble vitamins basically are absorbed and digested the same way that fat is. And then a lot of the fat-soluble vitamins are excreted more so in the feces than in the urine, whereas water-soluble vitamins, for the most part, are excreted uh, in the urine. So yeah, they're kind of two like major groupings. And then another concept I just want to introduce you to is a vitamer. So a vitamer is when a vitamin has several different compounds that can act as that vitamin. They tend to have somewhat similar structures, but pretty different functions in the body. And I know this concept is a little confusing. Um, it will become a bit more clear when I actually show you the vitamins. So basically, I, mean, I know you all have heard of vitamin A, but vitamin A is actually a group of three different compounds. So it's retinol, retinal, and retinoic acid. So they're three different compounds that have you know, kind of similar structures, but each of these things do entirely different things in the body. So we'll, you know, I'll explain more of that when um, we get to the specific uh, vitamins that have vitamins. And not everyone does. So vitamin C, for instance, does not have a bunch of different compounds that do the kind of general, or that kind of look like vitamin C, I guess. So some of them have it, and when they do, I'll uh, show you which ones. All right, so just to quickly um, review the DRIs. So the DRIs, remember, I know that Kelsey went over these with you in detail, um, but just remember that um, the DRIs are basically a set of nutrient-based reference values. Uh, this was all kind of started in the late 90s. So I took this class about 20 years ago, and at the time this was like very exciting. Um, we didn't have the DRIs back then, but we knew that they were coming and that they were about to be um, kind of uh, released. So yeah, we're all kind of excited about that, being nutrition nerds and all. Um, and these replaced what was then called in the U.S. the recommended dietary allowances. So that was used up until basically the year 2000. And then in Canada, it was called the recommended nutrient intakes. So the DRIs are used in both Canada and the U.S. And yeah, they replaced the old versions. So remember that it's a set of four reference values. And the reason I'm going over this is because we actually refer to the DRIs pretty much daily. So I really want to make sure we're all on the same page and that everyone understands what these definitions are because we do use them very regularly uh, when talking about vitamins and minerals. So the first is the EAR, estimated average requirement. Then there's the RDA, recommended dietary allowance. AI, adequate intake, and then the TUL or the UL, tolerable upper intake level. And if you do have the textbook, um, the textbook has a nice summary of 
basically all the RDAs and AIs for all the vitamins and minerals just on the inside cover. And it shows you, um, yeah, for like what age groups as well. So that's a nice summary table there. Um, if not, you can also just the DRI books, you can, I think that it's like free access from the National Academy of Sciences. So you can just download those books and then those tables are also pretty easy to find on the internet. Um, you don't need them though, because basically any value that you'll need to know I have in lecture slides. So first of all, the estimated average requirement, EAR, Remember, that's the average daily nutrient intake level that meets the requirements of 50% of healthy individuals. And, you know, this one's categorized by life stage and gender group as well, like all the other ones. But the main thing I want you to remember for this one, this one is for population groups. So really, in all honesty, we're pretty much never going to talk about this one again, because this is used in kind of public health approaches for policy, that type of thing, when you're trying to design some type of public health initiative um, for nutrition, that is what, that's when you use the EAR. So, you know, if you are interested in going into public health, you'll probably be using this a lot more. But for the sake of dietary counseling, kind of like one-on-one -on -one for someone's specific needs, we do not use those. So just remember, EAR is for population groups, for public health policy and nutrition, that type of thing. The RDAs, however, we will be referring to pretty much in every lecture. So that's the average daily nutrient intake level. Remember that meets the requirements of 98% of individuals. So if we look down here, this is you increase your intake level and this is the risk of inadequacy. So here they're just showing you that you have a pretty low risk of inadequacy or having like a deficiency in that vitamin, that's where the RDA sits. Whereas the EAR, remember, it's 50%, so it sits a little bit higher. Um, so why is it 98%? I always found this pretty weird, but again, I'm sure Kelsey went over it. It's because it's set two standard deviations above um, the EAR. So that's why it's at 98%. But basically, they're just assuming that it, it meets pretty much everyone's needs. And yeah, this is the one that if you're doing one-on-one -on -one dietary counseling or working in a hospital and having to come up with, um, you know, foods for specific individuals, diet plans, it's the RDA that you'll, you'll be using. And then obviously the number, the amount that someone needs really different, differs according to their life stage or gender group. So how old they are. Uh, and it's also um, organized by sex as well. So adequate intake, remember, that's the one that's used when the RDA has not been established. So it possibly meets the requirements of most, health, most healthy individuals. Um, this one is also organized by life stage and gender group. So the way that, I know that you know this definition, but if you want to, kind of the way that I've always seen this is that there's basically not enough science for the RDA to be established. So then they just look at well, what is everyone eating? Like how much vitamin K or whatever it is, how much are people like just typically eating and do they seem to have a deficiency disorder? So it's basically like a rough estimate of the amount of the vitamin or mineral that can keep people healthy, even though there's not enough like firm science behind it. So you can look the DRI books again, you know, you can access them really easily on the internet. Um, they basically go over all the studies that are used to formulate the RDAs. They go over some of the kind of smaller studies that are used to formulate the adequate intakes. Um, they also go over like how they set the ULs and all that. And basically it's kind of like a summary of, of what studies were used and, and why. So there, yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting. It's pretty dense though, but, um, you know, like some of the hot topic vitamins, like the vitamin D and stuff like that, if you're into that and wondering why it was kind of the new intake level set so low, you can go through all the studies that they use to, um, kind of validate that. So yeah, that, that's pretty much what the DRIs are, the DRI books. Uh, tolerable upper intake level. So the UL sometimes referred to as the TUL. Um, remember that's the highest average daily nutrient intake level that poses no risk of adverse health effects. 
So on this side here, risk of adverse effects, intake level, remember the TUL is set right before things start getting bad, basically. So you can take in this amount and you're not going to see any of those adverse health effects. So some people are a little bit confused and they think it's like the amount that you take in right when you start seeing these kind of toxicity effects, but it's not. It's the highest amount you can take in without seeing toxicity effects. And then, yeah, as you take in more, your risk of um, seeing those effects are higher. So examples of the DRIs, as I'm sure you learned in your research methods class, basically it's organized by life stage and gender group. And this was the major difference from the ones in the 90s. They were way more rough estimates. I think they grouped all children together, adults together, that type of thing. But now they have specific ones for pregnancy, lactation, uh, they organize females, you know, it's even like when you're an infant, when you're a young child, when you're 9 to 13, when you're a teenager, when you're a younger adult, etc. So it's very specific for every kind of um, age group. So yeah, just a really quick review, which I, I usually do um, a lot of reviews in class when obviously people are in front of me and I'm not just by myself at home. But um, just to kind of quickly jog your memory, what's the difference between an RDA and an AI? So what is an AI? Remember, that's the one that's used when there's not enough scientific data to set the RDA. So it's kind of like an educated guess. We look at how much people are taking in of the vitamin. They don't seem to be having any issues, like health issues. So we're, uh, you know, kind of guessing that that's an okay level to use until we get an RDA. And then what's the UL? So the UL, that's the toxicity one. So that's the highest amount you can take in and not get sick or not see those like toxicity effects. So and then right after you start taking like a gram more or like a milligram more, I should say, that's when toxicity effects have started to be noticed. So again, these are the reason I'm looking at these in, in detail is because we do talk about them um, basically in every single lecture. So definitely, if you're confused about these terms, please bring it up at the live session. Um, Great. So yeah, please also watch the uh, first vitamin C lecture, part one. That's the next one to watch after this. And then please tune in on Friday at 12 o'clock. Uh, Zoom link is on Blackboard. And I'm happy to answer any questions you had about the lectures. And yeah, I hope you all have a great rest of your day. And I can't wait to see your faces. All right. Have a good one. Bye.